We have 120, 131 altogether. Shall we wait a uh, few minutes, Chah, but the students yeah, are joining? Sir, sir. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so, so I, uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure and I'm delighted to introduce uh, uh, my colleague in my department, uh, Dr. Chamar Dalugama, lecturer in medicine and uh, a senior registrar in medicine. And currently Chamar is working in uh, Oxford University Hospital, one of most prestigious hospitals in the world. He's working as um, international clinical fellow in acute medicine. Uh, going back to Chamara's uh, academy, uh, undergraduate career, actually, university life, Chamara graduated in 2013, um, and he was uh, first in the All-Island Merit List, and then he had uh, first classes uh, for every subject, subject uh, sorry, uh, first classes for every exam, and uh, distinction in every subject, and uh, Chamara had... Uh, has the highest number of awards, medals, scholarships. The total number is 27. As far as I know, no one has uh, broken his record yet. The most, also the highest number of uh, medals, awards and scholarships in the faculty, 27 total. And then um, Chamara's uh, postgraduate qualification, of course, he has MRCP uh, in uh, London, an MRCPE, MRCP Glasgow, then MRCP Acute Medicine, MRCP Geriatrics, and MRCP Endocrine. So the list is very long, actually. And uh, so I'm very much happy and delighted to introduce uh, Chamara to this audience. And also Chamara, uh, and also one more point, Chamara became the best teacher uh, when he was here before he left to UK uh, two years back. So he was awarded as the best teacher by the, you know, by the students. So that's something very big achievement for a young lecturer. So, and he's a very good teacher and uh, students are really fond of him. And I'm very happy to hear that Chamari will be back in uh, late October. Am I correct, Chamari? Yes, the first week of November, actually. Uh, I already booked the flights. Yeah. <laughs> students will be very, very lucky to have you. And, and one more thing, uh, Chamari right now working in UK is very busy. But despite his very busy schedule, Chamar did not uh, say no to our request. In fact, I requested Chamar because I know his capability. Oh. And Chamar will speak on a very common topic, actually. Pyrexia of unknown origin. And this is a very hot topic uh, in exams. And, um, and he, I'm sure he will uh, address common issues. And later he will discuss MCQ. So Chamar, so on behalf of PEMSA and the president, uh, uh, Professor Tushar Pudagamana and the coordinator of this program, uh, Dr. Duminde Asaratna, I warmly welcome and uh, you are joining from UK to this uh, PEMSA case based discussion. Over to you, Chamada. All right, thank you very much, sir. Um, all right, um, good evening. Welcome to the uh, case based discussion organized by the PEMSA. And actually, first I would thank uh, Tilaksa for that very kind and very generous introduction of me. And uh, so I think uh, the students wise, uh, probably we have not met before in person because I was not in Peradini for like last 15 months. But I think it's, it's a great privilege and I'm very happy that at least this sort of a virtual sort of setting to meet the students. And I'm very much grateful to PEMSA as well for organizing this sort of events in this period of time where the real clinical medicine is not, it's a bit difficult. Um, so uh, today the case will be on one of the very common topics as uh, Tilaksa mentioned, that's about the pyrexia of unknown origin or what they commonly called pyrexia of undetermined etiology. So basically the case that I'm going to discuss today is a real case that I have encountered, uh, I would say roughly four months back. And initially I was thinking whether I should sort of modify it according to the Sri Lankan setting, but then I thought I might lose the originality of the case. So we'll discuss the original case 
and see how we can approach this sort of a presentation. And in the introduction side, slide, there is this person, is Sherlock Holmes. So at the end of this discussion, what I want you to be is someone like Sherlock Holmes to keep your senses open and walk through with me with the story and try to sort of have a good set of differential diagnosis and to reach a diagnosis after reviewing the examination and investigations. All right. So oh, one second. Just bear with me for a second. All right, so here we start. So this is about a 32 year old Caucasian male, a white male. And he comes to the medical take and he gives us a small story. So his story is that he says, doc, look here. I have been having these high fevers for last three to four weeks. And for the similar period, I have been feeling increasingly breathless. And for the last one week, I've been feeling very breathless and at sleep, I'm using many pillows to keep myself propped up. And still I wake up in the middle of the night feeling very breathless. And I have noticed some swelling in my legs. <laughs> and uh, I'm having some joint pain in, involving my ankles, knees and elbows. So that is the story that he presented to it, to the acute medical take. So basically, as a young Sherlock Holmes, you got a collection of symptoms. This is a young chap coming with a lone febrile illness. Some symptoms suggest you of heart failure and some systemic symptoms where he's feeling generally unwell, some joint symptoms. All right, so what are your thoughts? So you have to sort of dig deep into his story to come to a diagnosis. All right, still this story doesn't qualify as a PUO because he has not been investigated or examined yet. So we will take one by one symptoms and see what we can work out from these symptoms. So the first complaint is he's complaining of three to four weeks history of a febrile illness. So when somebody comes with a febrile illness, it's very important to get, get a thorough detailed history of the fever. So what he described was a fever, which is like three to four weeks back, which is of acute onset and the character is remittent. So what it means is that he has been having continuous temp temperature throughout, which is fluctuating, but it never comes to the baseline. And in between, he was having high intermittent spikes of fever, which is more than 39 degrees. And then we asked, Look here, do you remember anything, any, any clear precipitant, anything happened just before you got the fever? His answer was no. So there was no clear antecedent event when he got the fever. And then we were inquiring about any associated symptoms. Did you have any chills, rigors? No. But the main other complaint with the fever he had was that he's been feeling very unwell, tired and lethargic. So with this fever, then we were digging deep into systemic symptoms to see whether he, had got, he has got any organ specific infective symptoms. So starting from head to toe, do you have any headache, any sinus pain, any runny nose, sore throat, cough, pleurisy, palpitations, any abdominal pain, discomfort, any diarrhea, constipation, any trouble with the water work, any skin infections, all the answers were no. I'm just feeling, I'm just having high fevers and feeling unwell, but there was nothing to pinpoint for any particular organ as chest or abdomen. 
Okay. Then the second set of symptoms he had was this heart failure symptoms. And he was a young, fit male, but now just four weeks his job worsening breathlessness, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and some leg swelling. So we asked prior to this event, he was fit and well, and he was running and cycling 10 miles a day. And he did not have any significant previous cardiac history. And he does not have any chest pain palpitations. And then we thought about possible anemia as well, because it can make a person going to, to have heart failure symptoms, but he did not have any symptoms of anemia, any evidence of blood loss. So here also we could not narrow down our differentials to uh, like a clear differential. And then the third set of symptoms he was having were the systemic symptoms of inflammatory type joint pain. And he described the joint pain mainly involving in the large joints. He had bilateral knee pain, ankle pain, and the elbow pain. And these pains were associated with significant morning stiffness, which is lasting longer than one hour. And there was no involvement of the small joints. And obviously there were no joints swelling, according to him. And he did not have any rash, any oral ulcers, any hemoptysis, epistaxis, hematuria, and or alteration of bowel habits. He did complain of a significant loss of appetite, but over the four weeks, there was no significant loss of weight and he denied any night sweats. Fine. So, so we have sort of analyzed his presenting complaint. We have analyzed the fever and then we have asked things related to his heart failure symptoms and we have analyzed his systemic symptoms mainly in the form of inflammatory arthralgia. Then we went in, to, in detail to his past medical history. Well, he had childhood asthma, but no recent exacerbations for last 10, 10, 15 years. And he had COVID-19 in last year, March. And following that, he has been double vaccinated, two Pfizer doses and the last dose three months back. He did not have any surgeries in the past. And the travel history. So, I mean, he has been traveling in and around England and East Europe, but his travel history to India, where he stayed six weeks, two years back, was noted as a significant event. And then the family history, there was no family history of significant heart problems, autoimmunity or malignancy. And the social history, he is a postdoc in the Oxford University, an academic, and he was living with his partner and he denied any high risk sex behaviors. He's a non-smoker, would say a social drinker and no recreational medications, no tattooing, intravenous drugs, unpasteurized milk, raw meat, exotic hobbies, or no pets at home. Okay. So this is the brief story of this 32 year old male. So if I am to summarize, He's a 32-year-old academic who was fit and well, no significant past medical history, presenting with a lone febrile illness of three to four weeks associated with heart failure symptoms and inflammatory type joint pain. And he's constitutionally unwell, but there is no clear organ-specific infective symptoms. Okay, so now it's your duty. I mean, even before examining, it's your duty to sort of brainstorm and see what possibilities could this man be having? So what are the possibilities for his fever, for his heart failure symptoms and his systemic symptoms? So if this was a word setting, I will be sort of getting you to talk to come up with differentials, but Unfortunately, with this big number of students in a virtual setting, it will not be practically possible. So uh, we will discuss what are the possibilities. So obviously, coming with fever, we have to think about 
infect you causes. So given his heart failure symptoms, the joint pains, I would consider the possibility of infective endocarditis as a possible diagnosis. And then the myocarditis and pericarditis could be predominantly viral in origin, but they could have fever. They could get these old viral arthralgias and then they can go into heart failure, myocarditis and pericarditis. And then tuberculosis. I mean, this was highlighted here, caught in that he has been in India two years back for six weeks. Um, so that was considered as a possibility. And then the HIV, again, we'll have to consider in every patient with pyrexia of unknown origin. And then the other rare infective causes, which could affect the heart and the joints. So, I mean, the epidemiology is a bit different, but Lyme disease is common here. So considered possibility of Lyme disease and mycoplasma infections, syphilis, brucellosis, Q fever, and Rickard's cell infections. So there was a whole lot of infective causes that we considered as a possibility. So it's not always the infective causes that lead to a piracy of unknown origin. So we thought of possible uh, autoimmune causes as well. So the connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, SLA, Sjogren's, autoimmune thyroiditis, Stills disease. So there were a whole sort of autoimmune causes that we were keeping in the back of our mind that could be possible. And then, not common, but rarely certain endocrine causes. Thyrotoxicosis obviously can cause uh, heart failure symptoms as like high output cardiac failure. And also thyrotoxicosis can cause fever. So thyrotoxicosis, fear chromocytoma, carcinoid syndrome, all were considered very lower down in the differentials, but as possibilities. And then malignancies. I mean, in a 32 year old fit and well, the short, I mean, a four weeks history of uh, these symptoms, we are mainly thinking of possible hematological malignancies like leukemias and lymphomas. I mean, it could be the hematological malignancies causing anemia leading to heart failure and causing fever. Or else this could be certain leukemoid infiltration of the heart causing heart failure and also causing fever. So there have a whole set of differential diagnosis in the back of our mind when we are going to examine this patient. So keeping all these differentials, I mean, it's a very broad differential diagnosis at the end of history. So we examine the patient. Okay, so in general examination, he was averagely built, BMI was 21. It's not pale, not icteric. And he had a right supraclavicular lymph node, which is one centimeter firm, but no other palpable nodes elsewhere. No splinter hemorrhages, chain lesions, or nail infarcts that we have very actively looked for because the infective endocarditis was one of the differentials that we had in our back of our mind. And he did not have any rashes. And his cardiovascular examination, he had a pulse of 94 beats per minute, which was regularly regular. And his JVP was elevated at three centimeters. And his blood pressure was 130 by 60. And he had a thrust in apex, but it was not displaced. And there was a loud pan-systolic murmur at the apex, which was radiant to the axilla. So basically, so he had clinical evidence of mitral regurgitation. And it was rather acute mitral regurgitation, we thought, because he had, the apex was not displaced and he was in atrial fibrillation. And his respiratory examination was slightly tachypneic, had borderline saturations on room hair around 95%. And there were bibasal crackles in the auscultation. And his abdomen was soft and non-tender, he had one centimeter hepatomegaly with a smooth surface and regular border. 
no palpable spleen, no free fluid, no beltable masses. And then we did a neurology examination. Basically, there were no lawn tract signs, neck was supple, and the fundus, no rot spots, no hemorrhages, or no choroid tubercles. And then the musculoskeletal examination, because he was having these joint symptoms, the large joints were tender, but there was no obvious swelling, crepitus, vomit, or erythema. So at the end of examination, okay, we have a 32-year-old, averagely built male, no peripheral stigmata of infectious endocarditis, was pale, with one centimeter cervical lymph node, and a pansystolic murmur with an undisplaced apex, clinically suggestive of acute mitral regurgitation, and he's clinical in heart failure, evidenced by bibasal crackles with pitting lower limb swelling. So this was the summary of examination. So then we went back to our differential diagnosis. Can we narrow down our differential diagnosis? Well, there's one thing that came to the top of our differentials, giving this new regurgitant murmur, fever, is this infective endocarditis? We thought, yeah, it's possible, but it could be something else as well. Then we started investigating this patient. So there's one important thing when it comes to investigating in a pyrexia of unknown origin that you should not be doing blanket investigations just to cover all the bases. Your investigations should be very targeted and very objective. So thinking the set of differential diagnosis, we started with basic investigations with a full blood count. So even in the exam, if you, if you get a patient with a PUO, we don't want you to sort of rattle out a list of investigations, but we want you to tell the investigation and what you expect in the investigation according to your differential diagnosis. So keeping the differential diagnosis in your mind, this is the full blood count. So he had a white count of 15, which is neutrophilic. It was like more than 95% neutrophils. And his hemoglobin was 9.1 with MCV of 82. And his platelet count was 150. So basically he has neutrophil leukocytosis with a bicytopenia. He has a normocytic anemia and marginally low platelet count. And the full blood count came along with a blood picture because of the abnormalities. So it said normocytic anemia with low platelets and neutrophils with left shift and toxic granules. And there was marked Rule formation. So obviously, looking at this investigation, you know, there is something going on with this man. So it's been anemic and there's something, infl some inflammation is going on as there is marker rule formation. And there is some bone marrow involvement because the platelet count is low, the HB is low, and then the neutrophils are toxic and with a left shift. So again, in our differentials, the impossibility of infection came up, came to the top. And then he had the inflammatory markers. So ESR was 70 millimeters in the first hour and CRP was 80. And then we did the basic liver and renal tests. So the rationale for this is one thing is as a basic screening set, uh, set of investigations. And the other thing is this man was having multi-system involvement. I mean, he was having cardiac involvement, he was having joint involvement, and he was anemic and according to the full blood count, he was had some uh, cell dyscrasia, so hematological involvement. So we wanted to, to make sure that other systems are involved or not. So his kidneys were fine. So the creatinine was normal, the blood urea was normal, but there was some derangement in the liver enzymes. So his ALT was elevated, AST was elevated, but ALP and bilirubin was within the normal range. So this picture is something like a hepatitis picture. So usually when we see deranged liver enzymes, 
we think whether this is sort of a cholestatic picture or a hepatitis, hepatitis picture. So his ALP and bilirubin were normal. So the ALT was higher and it was higher than the AST. So there's some form of mild hepatitis going on. And his albumin was marginally low and his clotting profile was normal. Then very importantly, as the golden rule in every PO, you need ample cultures. So he had three sets of aerobic and anaerobic blood cultures where there was no growth after 72 hours of incubation. And here, we really believed on the cultures. The reason being, uh, here the setup is that patients do not have access to any antibiotics over the counter. And PUOs are not generally treated, treated by the general practitioners. They, got, they get referred, the, I mean, they refer the patient to the hospital. But if the same scenario, in Sri Lanka, you would expect the patient to visit at least two, G, uh, two uh, general practitioners and get a course of amoxicillin, not settle in, then get a course of coamoxiclavin, clarithromycin, and another GP would give a course of steroids. So by the time the patient comes to us, to the hospital, the picture will be very different and it will be very much masked. But here, it was an untreated case, no antibiotics, no steroids come into the medical tech and had three sets of blood cultures taken with universal precautions and all three cultures were negative, which made us think, why? What's the reason? So he had three negative blood cultures. And then he had some basic imaging. So given his heart failure symptoms, he had a chest X-ray which basically shows, so what you can see here is, uh, there's a bit of upper lobe blood diversion. So there's a bit of peribronchial coughing, and then there's fluid in the transverse fissure and small bilateral pleural effusion. So this X-ray would say there is evidence of pulmonary edema. Well, heart is not, I would say it's like maybe 50% of the cardiothoracic ratio. So it's not a massive heart, but there is evidence of heart failure. And then the patient had the urine testing. So just in the urine deep, there was trace amount of protein, just few red cells, no white cells, no casts, and urine culture was negative. Then at the end of these basic investigations, we arranged an ur urgent 2D echocardiogram. The reason being he had a clear murmur in clinical examination. And he was in heart failure. So this is the patient's uh, transthoracic echo. So this is the parasternal lower axis, where you can see the mitral valve, where the mitral valve, the anterior mitral valve leaflet was flail. And there was a clear severe regurgitant murmur, uh, mitral regurgitant murmur. And then it was reported as a possible vegetation on the anterior mitral valve leaflet. Okay, so then there was echo evidence of possible mitral valve endocarditis. And because of the severe mitral regurgitation, patient was in heart failure. I mean, then we thought, okay, the case is self-explanatory. So he has fever, he has a new murmur, and there is echo evidence of mitral regurgitation with a possible vegetation. But to make a diagnosis of infective endocarditis, there's a set of criteria where the blood cultures are very important because it is one of the two major criteria. So having a positive blood culture of the typical organisms, at least two, or the common organisms, you should have persistently positive blood cultures, or at least one positive blood culture with the coxella. But his cultures were persistently negative. And that was, I mean, he has not had any antibiotics prior to the cultures as well. So he had the echocardiogram, which was suggestive of uh, new mitral regurgitation, 
And we were thinking about the other minor criteria of infective endocarditis. Clearly, he did not have any predisposition for infective endocarditis. In his GP records, he did not have any murmurs before presenting to us. And then he did not have any vascular phenomena or any immunological phenomena. We have done a thorough examination. We did not find any Janeway lesions, oscillin, um, uh, what do you call it? Oscillin nodes, rot spots, any retinal hemorrhages, anything like that. And his urine dip was negative. So he was not fulfilling the essential criteria to make a diagnosis of infective endocarditis. So that made us to look for other possible causes of blood culture negative endocarditis. So he had Brucella serology, which was negative. He had the Coxella serology, which was negative. Bartonella serology, thinking of, uh, uh, yeah, it was negative. And Microplasma serology was negative. And Legionella, negative. So whole set of negative investigations. And then he had the other viral screen, HIV, CMV, EBV, toxoplasma, the parasitic, everything was negative. And then we had, we have arranged a transesophageal echo to have a clear look at the mitral path. So it again confirmed mitral regurgitation with a cord rupture. And there were nodular thickenings on the anterior mitral valve leaf blood, suspicious for possible vegetations. So again, the question, is this really endocarditis? So all these investigations were arranged within 24 to 36 hours of admission. So except, I mean, yeah, the blood cut just took three days, but rest of the investigations were arranged during the first couple of days. So everything was negative. And then we were thinking, could this be something non-infective? So he had the basic autoimmune screening with an ANA, rheumatoid factor, and antipospolipid antibodies. All these were negative. And he had the thyroid functions, which were normal. So then we were desperate for a diagnosis. So he is now in his fourth day of hospital admission. He had more than uh, three weeks of fever. So he is now qualifying actually for a diagnosis of pyrexia of undetermined etiology. Then the next thing we did was he had a full body CT, a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis. Well, his CT chest, there was evidence of pulmonary edema, there were fluid, but no consolidations or anything suggestive of any infective or in origin. And his abdomen pelvis showed the liver is enlarged. There was a prominent spleen, no free fluid, but there were no focal con collections. Well, again, we were hopeless. So CT cap is of not help. And then you're thinking, okay, he was anemic and he had a low platelet count. So the patient underwent a bone marrow biopsy. Again, bone marrow was hypocellular, but there was no evidence of granuloma malignancy. And later on in retrospective, the bone marrow cultures, TB, brucella, and leishmaniasis, all were negative. So he had a negative bone marrow as well. Okay. So when he was with us, undergoing all these investigations, he actually deteriorated. He was having ongoing fevers. He developed new oxygen requirement. His pulmonary edema was getting worse and he was becoming gradually hypotensive. And we did a BNP just to get a prognostic idea about his heart failure and it was more than 80,000. So in this case, we could not hold antibiotics any longer. Although he had negative cultures, although the teaching is that in stable patients, you should not start antibiotics until you find a cause, but he's obviously not stable. He was deteriorating. So as per trust guidelines, the antibiotics were started to, with vancomycin, keftraxone, and gentamicin. And then he became hypotensive when he was admitted to the ITU. 
and he was started on inotropes, noradrenaline, and titrated according to the blood pressure, and he was started on a furosemide infusion. Then, this was the question. So he had continued fever. He was not improving, rather he was deteriorating, and he was not responding to the antibiotics. Even after starting antibiotics, he was not responding. So the question was, could this be something else? We're thinking of possible blood culture negative endocarditis. And he was having persistent fevers despite antibiotics. Is this something non-infective, some other inflammatory pathology? Or is it something viral, something fungal? So there were a lot of questions. Then this patient was subjected to a PET scan. So FGD PET scan is one of the very useful investigations when it comes to difficult cases or like clinical dilemmas in pyrexia for unknown origin. So his PET body scan, this PET scan basically failed to demonstrate any focus of inflammation. So if you look here, I mean, the, there's increased stress uptake in the kidneys, in the bladder, in the liver, in bit of the heart. But so in close images, there was no pit of this radioisotope uptake in the valve areas. So it basically sort of excluding the possibility of infective and endocarditis. So he, with the negative PET scan, we stopped the antibiotics because it, there was no clinical response and he had persistent negative cultures. So of course these antibiotics were continued for 72 hours and then they were always stopped because of the lack of response. Fine. So then we were back in square one. So what's happening with this man? Fever, worsening heart failure and this lot of systemic symptoms, mainly in the form of musculoskeletal involvement. So we went back to the examination. And actually, this is not his real fever chart, but it was in the electronic record. So, but his fever was something like this. Throughout the ITU admission, throughout the hospital admissions, he was having a remittent fever and intermittently high spikes. And then we went back to the general examination. So on admission, he had a cervical lymph node. But when we examined later on, he had cervical lymph nodes, multiple axillary lymph nodes, and the largest lymph node mean 1.5 centimeters in the supraclavicular region. And then he noticed to have a faint macular papular rash in his trunk. And this is the photo of that. So this rash was new lymph nodes and ongoing fevers. And on day six, in the abdominal examination, he had a two centimeter soft spleen and soft hepatomegaly, which he had on admission and there was no free fluid. So we have sort of, in the repeat examination, we have some no information. So he has new lymph nodes and a rash and hepatosplenomegaly. Any thoughts? So what do you think? What could be the possible diagnosis or possible differential diagnosis? So in summary, he had a fever leukocytosis, lymphadenopathy, raised inflammatory markers, deranged liver enzymes, hepatosplenomegaly, and negative autoimmune screen, including negative rheumatoid factor and ANA. And there was no evidence of infective etiology as, it, as evidenced by persistently negative cultures and persistent absence of clinical response to broad spectrum antibiotics. So finally, we did one additional blood test. He had a ferritin level done, which came as 31,000. 
So we made a possible diagnosis of adult onset Steele's disease. So then he was managed by the acute medical team and the rheumatology team. And he was started on steroids, prednisolone, one milligram per kg per day. And he made a marked response to steroid therapy. Fever started settling and the inflammatory markers all improved and his inotropes were weaned off. His intravenous frusamide was switched to oral frusamide and he was started on some uh, prognostic medications for his heart failure. And he was discharged four weeks after admission with the follow-up with rheumatologist and cardiac surgeon. And two weeks later, which is very quick in this setting, he got admitted to cardiothoracic ward, had a mitral valve replaced, a metallic mitral valve. And the mitral valve histology revealed that it has there's fibrosis and uh, myxoid degeneration. So that's the story of this young man <clears throat> where the final diagnosis of adult onset Steele's disease was made. So just to brief very little about the adult onset Steele's disease, it's a systemic disorder with no clear etiology. And it's with a triad of brash, high spike in fevers and arthralgia or arthritis. And the most important thing, as we discussed in this case, this disease does not have any diagnostic test or serological markers. So it completely depends on a thorough clinical assessment and excluding other alternative possibilities. And this is known to cause systemic involvement in the form of hepatosplenomegaly, pleural effusions, cardiac involvement, as in this case, renal and hematological complications. So I don't think this is something very necessary for you to remember by heart, but because there is no definite diagnostic test or any serological test, we stick to some criterion to sort of make a diagnosis of Steele's disease. So when you look at these criteria, which are called Yamaguchi criteria, our man, the 32 year old man was having fever which is ongoing for more than three weeks. Yes, it's there. And he was having arthralgia, that is again for more than two weeks. And he had this rash, typical rash, which developed later on in the cause of disease. He had leukocytosis. He did not complain of a sore throat. And then he had this significant lymphadenopathy. He had hepatosplenomegaly. His liver enzymes were deranged and he had negative ANA and a rheumatoid factor. And beyond doubt, we have excluded possible infections with negative cultures and a whole body PET scan. And he had a bone marrow biopsy and CT abdopelvis, which looked at possible solid organ malignancies or hematological malignancies. I mean, in retrospect, when we look at, it makes a clear diagnosis of adult onset Steele's disease, but It needs a thorough history, a good examination, and an extensive diagnostic workup, which should be very targeted, finally, to come to this diagnosis, which is more or less a diagnosis of exclusion. So so at the end of this uh, case, we will briefly discuss about important things in evaluating a patient with a pyrexia of unknown origin. So by definition, this was a definition which was suggested by uh, Peter Stoff and Beeson in 1961, where the persistent fever more than 38.3 degrees Celsius that evades diagnosis for at least three weeks, including one week of investigation in hospital. But now this diagnosis has been modified. The definition has been modified and currently there are different categories of PUO. And basically we talk about three outpatient visits or three days in hospitals rather than a one week of hospital stay. 
So the classic PUO, where you have a temperature, which is going on for more than three weeks, and you are being evaluated in outpatient setting, at least in three visits, or you are being in the hospital for three days, still we can't find a clear etiology, a clear cause, you qualify for a diagnosis of PU. So there were like four classes or four categories of PU. One is the classic PU that what we have described in this case, where a man coming from the community with three to four weeks history of fever, and he has been evaluated and no diagnosis, even with very pragmatic, very uh, thorough investigations for three days in the hospital. And there is a category called nosocomial PU, where the temperature and the patient is in the hospital and patient did not have fever at the time of admission. And he has been evaluated for PUO for last three days, at least three days. And then there's the immunodeficient category where there's a lot of patients maybe post transplant uh, who are immunodeficient, who are neutropenic, having fever, and again, has been evaluated for three days. And this HIV associated PUO is another category, the fourth category in HIV patients. And there's a recent paper published where they have included another category called PUO in elderly, because they think in elderly, the PUO, the presentation is somewhat different. And then the other important thing is in the evaluation of PUO, the increasingly use of uh, this PET imaging has made sort of the diagnosis easier compared to old era. Because PET CT looks at the sites of inflammation. So basically it has a radioisotope, which is somewhat similar to glucose. And when the tissues are active, this glucose is avidly taken up by these tissues. So this, uh, FGD uptake is more in inflammatory tissues. So whole body PET is one of the important diagnostic tests that they recommend in evaluating of difficult cases of PU. And then this other important thing, the new molecular test, which is called 16SR RNA PCR, which is in practice here, where if you can't find any cause, if you think if you think about possible bacterial infection, you look for this ribosomal RNA in PCR. And this ribosomal RNA is very specific and very sensitive for bacteria. So if you find this one, you know, there is some bacterial infection going on in the body and you dig deep. And if this is negative, that is that has a very good negative predictive value of telling that, look here, this man is having fever, very unlikely due to a bacterial infection. And then there are serological tests for infections. So the PET CT and this molecular technique of looking for bacterial ribosomal RNA and serological tests for all sorts of infections have improved the diagnostic capability. And importantly, if you take 100 patients with PUO, has been extensively worked up, investigated, more than 50% will not have a cause found despite adequate investigations. But the good thing about this is this category, this 50% of patients where there is no cause found for PUO, their prognosis is excellent. And then the other thing is in this span, we have discussed we discussed about his fever. The, what, the fever he was having was a remittent fever where his fever was fluctuating up and down, but it was never coming down to the baseline. And intermittently he was having high spiking te uh, temperatures. So there are different patterns of clinical fevers. And it is very important because it might help you to sort of narrow down your differential diagnosis. So the first, diagram, it shows a continuous fever, where fever is continuous, and you commonly see this type of fever in rickettsial cell infections and in certain viral pneumonias. And then the one in the left, you have this recurrent fever. So you get high spike in fevers, and then you are fever-free for one or two days, and then you get another fever spike. 
So this is commonly seen in cases like malaria. And the remittent fever, the gentleman with us had a remittent fever. So basically, again, in typhus, sometimes in tuberculosis, in sepsis, you can get fevers like this, where it doesn't touch the baseline. And then you have the undulating fever, which is in the fourth diagram, where the fever nice, it's like a wave. It goes up and it comes down and it keeps on going up and down. So undulant fever is commonly seen in brucellosis and certain solid organ tumors. And then you can have intermittent fever where you get one or two intermittent spikes of fever per day. And certain viral fevers can have sort of biphasic fevers. So it's very important to get a good history with regard to the fever to see whether you can sort of put that fever into one of these patterns. So it might help you to come to a differential. And then the other important thing in investigating the PUO that investigations should be undertaken based on most likely cause. So in our gentleman, we were thinking of possible infective endocarditis. So he had an early echo and he had several sets of blood cultures. So likewise, your investigations need to be sort of tailor-made to the patient and most likely causes need to be investigated thoroughly. And the blanket investigations are not recommended because if they are positive, it is very difficult to interpret in the absence of suggestive exposure history or clinical syndrome. Say for instance, this man comes and the first invest investigation we do is an ANA, like as a set of blanket investigations, we order an ANA. And the ANA comes as strongly positive. But then it's very difficult to interpret because ANA in isolation, it's nothing. I mean, it can be false positive, it can be positive in the community. I mean, even if you take normal population, maybe five to 10% can have a positive ANA. So it's very difficult to interpret such tests. So always we discourage to do blanket investigations, but rather have a very targeted thorough set of investigations according to your differential diagnosis. And this is the other very important thing. Empirical trials, empirical therapeutic trials are not recommended before a diagnosis is made. So as in our patient also, the first 72 hours, he was well and we did not, I mean, we had a suspicion, strong suspicion of infective endocarditis because of the new regurgitant murmur, but he was well, his blood pressure was stable. So we did not start him antibiotics, but then he, when he became more unwell, we had to start antibiotics because we thought, I mean, he's getting severe sepsis. So the recommendation is that unless you believe the patient is having either miliary tuberculosis or central nervous system tuberculosis, temporal arthritis, or infective endocarditis with severe sepsis, you should not empirically start antibiotics, which is of course, not the common practice back home, because whenever we see fever, we interpret fever as what you call a, a syndrome of antibiotic deficiency. So we tend to give all sorts of antibiotics, one on the other, just to treat the fever. But the practice here is very clear that if you get a patient with a PUO and patient is otherwise well, you do all the investigations, you take repeated cultures, multiple cultures, and you might even the manage, even manage the patient as an outpatient, where you ask the patient to buy a thermometer and you ask them to mark the temperature and come back. But we don't treat with antibiotics unless these four categories. We think of possible disseminated TB, central nervous system TB, temporal arthritis, or infect you endocarditis with severe sepsis. And the other important thing is the overall outcome of patients with PUO is good. And particularly it becomes very good when you have not found a cause. So this is one other real scenario which I have encountered a few weeks back. Uh, it's not a full case, but just one slide. This was of, is of a 45-year-old lady who has been investigated for PUO who had raised inflammatory markers 
ongoing fevers, and as the previous case, who had persistently negative cultures. So that particular day during the ward round, uh, I mean, we had no clue. I mean, she had all sort of basic tests and then the imaging of chest, abdomen, pelvis, and then except for a PET CT, she had most of the investigations, all were negative. So uh, in the ward round, the consultant asked the medic one of the medical students here to look for lymph nodes. And when he was examining for lymph nodes in the neck, the patient was making the face like as she was very uncomfortable. And then the consultant, the comment was to the medical student, you have to be very gentle. You made the patient very uncomfortable during your examination. But unlike our students, the medical student said, no, I was extra careful. I was very gentle. I don't think I harmed the patient, but then it must be something, I mean, patient felt uncomfortable, then there must be something in his neck. <clears throat> so then consultant took the word and then we did a neck scan, which basically included the <clears throat> Doppler and a scan. So the thyroid was normal, but there was complete completely occluded right common carotid going up to the internal carotid artery. Then patient had a biopsy and it was a biopsy proven case of tachyasua arthritis and he made full recovery with steroids. So that is how PU was present. So it's very difficult to come to a diagnosis at the beginning. So it needs a lot of examination, a lot of history, a lot of examination a lot of investigations to finally to come to a diagnosis. Okay, so that brings to the end of the case discussion. So basically what today we discussed was is of a young male coming with a, a yes, I'm getting a question. Let me see that. Um, can we take rheumatic fever as a differential diagnosis here? Yes, of course. So you can take rheumatic fever as a differential diagnosis here, but actually probably the reason being uh, rheumatic fever is not very common here. So it was not considered as one of the top differentials, but obviously back home, I think we can consider the possibility of rheumatic fever as I said, as a diff common differential diagnosis. Yes, very good. Okay, have you got any other questions? All right, so we'll move to the MCQ. So I've got not many, but um, five MCQs. All right, so I'll just give you one minute for each MCQ so that you can just um, go through the MCQs and mark your answers. But I think practically it will not be possible to sort of get you to answer these questions, but we will just talk through at the end of one minute. All right. Um, okay, so there's one other question. Uh, if ANA is positive, still can we take this as Steele's disease? Um, well, I mean, ANA, in that case, we have to do the ANA uh, teeters to see how significant is the ANA. But usually in Steele's disease, ANA is not good because it is um, nothing to do with this uh, what you call the autoimmunity. So usually we expect the ANA to be negative in stereostasis, but always you can have the overlap. I mean, you can have some ANA positive in a man who can have stereostasis. So it is not an exclusion criteria, but usually we do ANA to sort of make sure ANA is negative before confirming a diagnosis of stereos. And when patient takes paracetamol for fever, how can we interpret the fever pattern as continuous or intermittent? So that's again a good question. So what we usually ask the patients is at least for, for a brief period, you, uh, I mean, get, you wait for the, like, wait until you get the fever and then you make a note of the fever and then you can take paracetamol and then see, we can sort of whether the fever is there or not, right? So it's, it becomes very tricky because fever makes you uncomfortable and you like to get paracetamol as a treatment, but at least for a day or two, if we can get a general idea of what the fever pattern is that helps the diagnosis. So it becomes tricky when the patient is on paracetamol. 
and what made them to do ferritin level as the investigation in previous case? Yes, because we thought about possible uh, direct onset steroids disease at the end of uh, having a negative PET CT and with the joint symptoms, the lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and the rash. And ferritin is not a diagnostic criteria of steroids disease, but usually very high ferritin levels are characteristic in steroids disease. Uh, and can TB cause, uh, yes, so sarcoidosis is again, can present with a pyrexia of unknown origin, but the pattern would be where the patient will be having, I mean, there are typical X-ray appearances in sarcoidosis where you can have bilateral lymphadenopathy and there can be some interstitial changes. And although I did not include in the investigations, the patient had a normal calcium and a normal AS level. So uh, we did not think the possibility of sarcoidosis in this case. And if patient takes paracetamol, how can we tell in the history in the exam about the fever pattern? Um, yes, so that's difficult, but you can get some idea, like at least how many spikes of fever the patient gets and uh, likewise, so it becomes tricky when you take antipyretics, I agree. And if the patient has past history of taking antipyretics, would be the changes in approach and procedure of this? Yes, obviously in that case, we will not be relying on the cultures that much. But here, the th having three sets of negative cultures, we were strongly suspecting the possibility of infective endocarditis because we, it was against infective endocarditis. But if the patient has had multiple causes of antibiotics and you expect the cultures to be negative at times. So in that case, uh, we were sort of still considering the possibility of infective endocarditis. And are the PET scans are done in any kind of cases in Sri Lanka? Um, well, of course, I know that's available in private sector, but I'm not sure about the government sector. And if the rash comes early in the disease, it changed the way you approached very early ferritin. Of course, yes. So that is why when you are, uh, that is, I think I put that option as one of the MCQs also, that usually you are supposed to daily examine a patient with a PUO to look for new physical signs. And obviously, if this rash was picked up early, then we will be considering the possibility of steroids early in the course. Is it possible to have in TB even though man to negative? Yes, of course. Uh, because in certain cases of tuberculosis, such as in like immunosuppressed patients, in HIV patients, and those patients who are on immunosuppressants, your man to can be negative. The reason being man to is a type of type four hypersensitivity reaction. So in immunosuppressed patients, the man to test can be negative. Uh, in pediatrics, there's a possibility of developing leg length discrepancy and marker genoa. I mean, in adult onset still disease, I mean, the patients are already grown up, so you don't expect any skeletal changes. And what is the pathogenesis of heart failure in the patient with Stills disease? It is not, yes, I agree, because Stills disease is sort of a systemic disease. So it can involve many organs. So it can involve the heart, it can involve the liver. So here, the pathogenesis of heart failure was the severe mitral regurgitation in this patient. So there is valvular involvement and valvular inflammation leading to cord rupture and mitral regurgitation. So that is the pathogenesis between heart failure, although it's not a common organ that is getting involved. How did they exclude a Rickett cell infection? Well, in this here, in this context, the Rickett cell infections are not common and the Rickett cell serology was negative. And can we, uh, able to identify sort of rash in a Sri Lankan patient because of course that becomes tricky because in a Caucasian the rash will be uh, more prominent but in uh, Sri Lankan I mean Asian population it will not be the case. So can you consider MISA as 
and DD, yes. So given the COVID infection, it could be a possibility, but he had the COVID infection like almost one year back and he was double vaccinated and with us, it was the COVID infection was negative. So it was not considered as a differential. How do you differentiate typhus and still rash? So basically typhus, the pathophysiology is it's a type of vasculitis. So you don't get a petechial rash, but in stills, this rash is a evanescent rash, and that is type of coming and going type of a rash. I mean, sometimes it tends to appear more prominently with fevers, and then it just fades down. So it is not there throughout. So that is how we sort of differentiate still rash from a typhus rash. All right, so do you have any other questions? All right, so let's go back to the MCQs. So um, in a PUO, in HIV infection, the following needs to be considered. So PUO in HIV is a category that we say, so can be caused by HIV seroconversion. Yes, so HIV seroconversion itself, I, I didn't give actually time for you to go through this MCQ. So just have one minute and then uh, we'll discuss the MCQ. Yes, good question. When the patient has anemia, isn't the iron studies done alone with the full blood count and blood picture? And if so, ferritin would have been known to be elevated by then. Yes, that's possible. But here this patient had a sort of a normocytic anemia and with rule formation, and there was no blood picture evidence of uh, iron deficiency. So it was not done in the beginning. But of course, if you had done it, you would see the ferritin will be elevated. And the other important thing is ferritin is an acute phase reactant. So even with infective endocarditis, in many inflammatory conditions, you expect the ferritin to be elevated. So usually the recommendation that if you think about iron deficiency anemia, but you should not evaluate it when, you have, when the patient is having some form of infection, high fevers, because then the ferritin can be falsely elevated. So even in infective endocarditis, all sort of infectious diseases, inflammatory conditions, you expect the ferritin to be high. But in still disease, the ferritin is very high, it can go beyond 10,000. And then, uh, if you have started antibiotics, how could we exclude infective endocarditis? Well, so there's this uh, set of diagnostic criteria where we look at the cultures, we look at the echo, and we look at other minor criteria. And the other thing is we look at the response to antibiotics. So sometimes it's difficult to make a clear diagnosis because if the patient has got all the antibiotics and having persistent negative cultures, but if the patient is having a, a co-evidence of a vegetation and we are continuing antibiotics and if the fever is gradually settling, that supports a diagnosis of infective endocarditis. But in our case, what happened was patient was then started for the appropriate broad spectrum antibiotics to cover infective endocarditis, but he did not have any clinical response whatsoever. So that's the reason which made us to think this could be something else. All right, so if we go back to the MCQ, uh, so PUO in HIV infection 
following need to be considered. Can be caused by HIV zero conversion. Yes, because HIV zero conversion can have a protein of different ways of manifest manifestations, different manifestations. So one common manifestation is present in as a PUO. So in PUO, one of the important thing that you should remember is everyone with a PUO should have HIV test. The second one is opportunistic infections needs to be considered when CD4 count is less than 200. Yes, that's again true because in HIV patients and if they are going to the AIDS stage and or in between, if they come with PUO, you have to look for all sorts of opportunistic infections. And thirdly, malignancy can be malignancy to be considered in all CD4 counts. Yes. So irrespective of the CD4 count, the HIV infection itself increases the risk of certain malignancies, particularly lymphoproliferative malignancies, Kaposi sarcoma. So if the patient is coming with the PUO, you should look for possibility of such malignancies. Thirdly, uh, the fourth option is immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome after starting heart. So if you get a HIV patient, you start the antiretroviral therapy, and then patient comes with the PUO, comes with ongoing fevers for weeks. The other important differential that you should consider is the iris, because it's immune reconstitution inflammatory. So the immunity is going to build up, and the patient may be having bits and pieces of various infections. So the body is going to attack against these infections. So you get some form of immune reaction, immune inflammatory response which makes you to have a fever. And then the other thing is malaria can present atypically in HIV patients diagnosing, causing a diagnostic dilemma. Again, it's true. Certain infections like malaria, salmonellosis, certain infections and tuberculosis. And these infections can present as PU or in HIV patients. And they don't present in the typical way because your inflammatory response is very much changed, molded from HIV. So they can have very atypical presentations, but you should think about these possible infections as well. Okay, so we'll go to the second question. So what are the important considerations when evaluating a PU? First one, physical examination need to be done every third day to pick up important physical signs. All patients with PUO should have HIV test. Empirical steroid trials can be used in the management and PET CT testing early in the diagnostic journey when there is no localized inclusion in the history of examination and positive IGRA is diagnostic of tuberculosis. Okay, just take 30 seconds and we'll discuss uh, these stems. Okay, the first one, physical examination need to be done every third day to pick up important physical signs. What do you think? How often would you do a physical examination? Actually, this stem I remembered from my final MBBS. This was one of the stems in one of the MCQs. And the answer is, ideally, you should be examining the patient daily. You should see the patient in your daily ward rounds to see anything, anything coming up that might help you to narrow down the differentials. So it's not every third day, it should be every day. And as we discussed earlier, all patients with PUO should have HIV test, yes. And empirical steroid trials can be used in the management. That's a big no. The reason being it completely masks the clinical presentation. And this becomes again, a big problem when it comes to the local setting. Because if this patient, if he had gone to one of the general practitioners, usually the antibiotic cocktail includes dexamethasone or maybe steroids. So in that case, uh, this picture would have been completely masked and patient might be feeling transiently better with the steroids. And then, I mean, if it's a case of malignancy or if it's a case of 
inflammatory conditions, steroid can sort of mask and delay the diagnosis. And then fourthly, the PET CT testing early in the patient's diagnostic journey. So as we discussed, this is one of the very important diagnostic tests that we can use uh, in uh, evaluating PUOS, particularly when we don't have any localizing clues in the history and examination. So PET CT will pick up any uh, foci of inflammation so that will help us to either guide for a biopsy if it, if you need a tissue diagnosis or we'll tell where it is. And positive IGRA is diagnostic of tuberculosis. No. It will, I mean, it is not diagnostic of tuberculosis. All right. So let's go to the third question. Uh, meliodosis is again something that we consider back home as one of the common causes of pyrexia of unknown origin. So the stem A is disease is transmitted to humans through direct contact with contaminated soil or water. Special culture techniques are needed to identify the organism. Treatment should be continued three to six months to prevent recurrence. And IV keftacidine is used in the intensive phase of treatment and commonly present with pneumonia and multiple abscesses. All right, so the stem A, I mean, the disease is transmitted to humans through direct contact with contaminated soil and water. Yes, that's true. And it remains dormant in the human body for ages, and particularly in patients who become immunosuppressed, maybe with diabetes, with CKD, steroids, and this tend to come up to the surface and cause disseminated meliod infections. And special culture techniques are needed to identify the organism. Yes, that's true. Because in routine culture, what we see is another pseudomonas growing. But you need specific special culture techniques to identify the organism. And of course, this is an organism which is very difficult to treat. So patient needs long months of treatment. So treatment should be continued up to three to six months to prevent recurrence, that's true. So in the intensive phase, what we use is we use either keftacidine or we use carbapenems, meropenem as a, treat, as a treatment for the intensive phase, which is usually up to two months. And what the, what the recommendation is that if it is superficial melioid infection, we can go for IV keftacidine. But if it is deep-seated infection, the so carbapenems are preferred and then you treat it for two to four weeks and then it is followed by an extensive period of like three to six months of cotrimexazole to prevent recurrences and then commonly present with pneumonia and multiple abscesses that's true so uh, that's how it commonly present but it can have bizarre presentations and abscesses in abnormal sites always you have to think about possibility of meliodosis Okay, question number four is regarding PUO, neoplastic fever characteristically respond to naproxen. Fever, drug fevers usually commences seven to 10 days after culprit medication and likely to settle within 96 hours of discontinuation. Addison's disease can present as a PUO. Non-infective causes make one third of all cases of PUO. Need to consider transplant rejection in patients with solid organ transplants. Okay, just take a few seconds and then we will discuss these four, five stems. Okay, so neoplastic fever is again a type of 
PUO. Usually, it is due to solid organ malignancies or sometimes due to leukemias and lymphomas, where you get a fever as a paraneoplastic manifestation of the malignancy. And one way of sort of uh, diagnosing it is a therapeutic trial with naproxen. So naproxen is known to sort of characteristically settle the neoplastic fevers. So that step is correct. So neoplastic fever characteristically respond to naproxen. And then the drug fevers is again, comes in the miscellaneous category of PUOs where certain medications can cause long lasting fevers. So it could be antibiotics, could be certain antihypertensives, certain uh, antithyroid medications which can present with drug fevers. And usually drug fevers start seven to 10 days after the culprit medication. And it, it, the norm is that once you discontinue the medication, the fever should settle within 96 hours. So if the fever continues even after settling, uh, even after stopping these culprit medications, so then it makes drug fevers less likely. So usually seven to 10 days after a medication and it tend to settle within 96 hours of discontinuation. And third is Addison's disease can present as a PU. So always when you talk about endocrine causes of PU, you should consider the thyrotoxicosis and Addison's disease as possible causes of pyrexia of unknown origin. So that is why in the diagnostic workup, if nothing is found, we tend to do the thyroid tests and the cortisol level, just to look at the possibility of these two. And the non-infective causes make one third of all cases of PU. So that is true. So it's usually 35% of cases of PU are non-infective causes, either inflammatory, malignant, or endocrine causes. And the other important thing is when you, uh, now we have solid organ transplant patients, post renal transplant, post liver transplant, and these patients are on quite a lot of immunosuppressants and they are always in and out of the hospitals. So when these transplant patients come with a fever, a long lasting, long standing fever, there are important differentials that you need to consider. So of course you will be considered opportunistic infections because these patients are immunosuppressed. And also these patients are at risk of getting common community acquired infections. You have to consider that as well. And thirdly, sometimes even without infection, the organ rejection or what you call sometimes the graft versus host disease or transplant rejection can present with a PU. So always you have to think about the possibility that possibility as well. Okay, so then we'll go to the last MCQ stem. So this is a single best answer. So we have a 65 year old retired school teacher who presents to the emergency department with a generalized tonic clonic seizure and following that she has low GCS. And her husband reports that she was having fever for last three weeks for which she had two visits to GP and she had two causes of broad spectrum antibiotics. So when you're assessing the patient, the GCS is eight. There's no lateralizing signs. Hemoglobin is 80. And so during the course, the patient gets a CSF analysis, which shows five white cells, 70 grams of protein and 30 milligrams of sugar, which is very low. And on questioning, she was on a pilgrimage to India two months back. So then what's the likely diagnosis in this case? So you have four options. Could this be a stroke? Um, apologies for the spelling mistake. Yeah. Could, could this be a stroke? Intracranial bleed, meningoencephalitis, cerebral abscess, cerebral malaria. So what's the single best answer? So if you take one by one, could this be a stroke? It becomes less likely given the history. One thing is she was having fevers and this presentation is sort of a gradual presentation. It doesn't sound like acute 
worsening neurology. And the other thing is in examination, she does not have any lateralizing signs, right? So stroke becomes very less likely. Similarly, intracranial bleed. But could this be meningoencephalitis? Meningoencephalitis, again, you can have patients presenting with uh, fever, seizures, but what is against meningoencephalitis is CSF analysis. There's only five white cells, and I would modify this as say all five are lymphocytes. And then the other thing is usually in meningoencephalitis, if it is due to bacterial in origin, you expect low sugars, but you don't expect sugars this low. And then could this be cerebral abscess? Well, if that's a cerebral abscess, still the presentation can be like this, low GCS, could be having ongoing fevers and could be having seizures, but usually you tend to expect lateralizing signs with a cerebral abscess, as well as we expect more uh, leukocyte response in CSF analysis. So finally, we are left with cerebral malaria. Well, there are a few things to support the diagnosis of a malaria. And she has been on pilgrimage to India where the malaria is common. Secondly, the patient is having these fevers and then now low GCS and the CSF shows very low sugars, which is again, commonly seen in malaria infections. And you don't see that much of a white count in malaria. And importantly, the patient is having a hemoglobin of 80 again. So it can cause anemia as well. So this is most likely answer would be a case of cerebral malaria. All right, so that brings to the end of five MCQs. Um, all right, so have you got any other questions? Um, in this one question I have not answered in diagnostic title four, adult onset steroid disease, good response to steroids were there as a minor criteria. So prior to diagnosis, we can't initiate steroids prophylactically to prevent deterioration of patient's condition. Well, that's a good question, but the problem is steroids can mask a lot of things. I mean, if that's a malignancy, if that's the case of um, other autoimmune, other inflammatory conditions, so steroids can mask all these things and which will not help us to sort of come to a diagnosis which we can treat. So always empirical steroid trial, trials are very much discouraged uh, unless it's, it's the last resort. Okay, have you got any other questions? Can prior antibiotics cause reduction in WBC in lumbar puncture? It's very unlikely because the oral antibiotics that we give is not at the doses, therapeutic doses, which penetrates the meninges. Mm -hmm. So if, if the patient is having meningoencephalitis, you don't expect a dramatic drop in uh, white count or the inflammatory response after a course of oral antibiotics. Can malaria relapse after a long time. Yes, of course, malaria can relapse after a long time. And here, I mean, here the guideline is that if a patient has visited a tropical country within last two years, we have to consider the possibility of malaria it's because certain malarias like uh, they can like sort of sequestered in the system for up to two years. So yes. Uh, so the age of adult onset still this is well, um, that's actually I'm not very clear what's the age category, but we have seen adult onset still this is even in patients with 40s, 50s. So I'm I'm sorry, I will not be able to give a definite uh, sort of age limit. Yes, TB meningitis given as an answer, can we, can, yes. I would say, I mean, if you, I mean, usually the questions, they will not try to sort of confuse the answers, like the malaria is likely here, but the TB meningitis is again a possibility. So uh, I would say meningitis is a possible differential, 
but malaria is uh, uh, possible than that. In this case, we should do, yes. Yes, if you consider malaria, you should do thick and thin blood films. Have you got any other questions? Um, all right, I think in the absence of any other questions, uh, thank you very much for the participation and I hope you have gained something which will sort of help you in your clinical journey. So thank you very much. Amara, one more thing. I think yes, uh, <laughs> on behalf of PEMSA, once again, thank you very much for that superb, excellent discussion. I enjoyed every bit of this discussion. And I think you addressed common issues in a patient with pyrexia of unknown origin, a very common uh, case uh, that we see in our clinical practice. So thank you, Chamara. And um, so um, that was very useful and you did in a very nice way. Thank you very much. And also what's the time now, Chamara, in UK? Uh, it's must, five o'clock. Five o'clock, okay, right now, yes, 9.30. <laughs> So uh, I think, uh, and uh, by, by looking at the number of questions and the quality of questions, I think the, your presentation was very effective. I'm so happy that the questions are very good. Do you agree with me, Chamar? The, the quality of questions, they were very good. So that shows okay, that sir. students are, um, uh, I mean, listening to you very carefully mm -hmm. and the yes. points that yeah, you address, they have taken very seriously. So exactly, that shows yeah. the effectiveness of your presentation. And that was super punch mm -hmm. So uh, on behalf of PEMSA and our president, uh, Professor Tushar Kudagamana, and the coordinator of this program, Dr. Dumindi Asaratna, once again, I want to thank for accept, thank you for accepting our invitation without any hesitation, despite your busy life in UK. And I'm happy that there are 340 students, Chamada. That was a very big number. Yes. So, so that shows how popular you are. I'm very happy about the participation and the presentation. Thank you, Shambhala, once again. So have a Thank very you, safe Anna, and pleasant journey back to UK. We are waiting for you, and especially students are waiting for you. I'm, sure I'm they also waiting to come back, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I can understand.